Добрый вечер. Меня зовут Виктория. Собака. Водка. Красивая женщина. And I think that's about my Russian knowledge after two years of voluntarily studying it and after my teachers telling me never ever to speak Russian again because my pronunciation was so bad. Um, nevertheless, I can read and write. I just don't know what I read and write. Oh, and I know Kalinka. <laughs> I would like to kick off our lengthy Soviet Union rocket history with the name Nikolai Kibalchich, a dreamer of rocket-powered spaceflight. In the 1880s, the Tsar and his noblemen rule over Russia, which is an absolute monarchy at this point. The lower classes are planning a revolution, and being an engineer, Kibalchich gets involved in it. He makes grenades that are used to kill Tsar Alexander II in 1881. While he is in prison waiting to be executed, he sketches a design for a rocket-powered passenger platform that could potentially take people into space. It was a totally open platform, so it never would have worked, but still. This is the 1800s. Our next step is Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who develops many of the principles and techniques still used in rocket science. He believes that a sealed ship might be suitable for space travel after scientists discover that air pressure falls rapidly with altitude and space is a vacuum. He carries out experiments to test what acceleration could living creatures survive 60 meters per second or 6g and works out the Earth's escape velocity, the speed needed to leave the gravitational force of our planet. This he calculates to be 11.7 kilometers per second, which is not too far from the truth at all. He concludes that people in any spacecraft could be crushed to death by the burst of acceleration needed. He thinks the solution is a self-contained rocket producing steady acceleration. He also realizes that multi-stage rockets, which he calls rocket trains, would be more efficient than single-stage ones. He comes up with the idea of using exhaust deflecting steering vanes to control a rocket in vacuum as well. He is also certain that liquid fuels are needed in order to reach space as the black powder used in those days is too weak. He states that the best choice would be liquid hydrogen fuel burning with liquid oxygen. These substances, however, are not available in his time in large amounts. Tolkovsky works as a teacher and over the years produces numerous models as demonstrations of his conclusions, but he never actually attempts to launch a rocket himself. He is acknowledged as the pioneer of new science after his death in 1935. In 1931, the Group for the Study of Reactive Motion is founded. The most important branches of this rocket society were the Moscow branch and the Leningrad branch. Many members of these branches would become influential people in the Soviet space program, like Sergei Korolyov, Mikhail Tikhonravov and Valentin Glushko. Most of Gerd's members work for the Soviet state and the society is soon absorbed into the Red Army. It is later merged with the Gas Dynamics Laboratory of Leningrad, creating the Jet Propulsion Research Institute. In 1933, the Moscow branch of GERD launches GERD-09 using liquid oxygen to burn a petroleum gel fuel for producing combustion gases and thrust. The design for the rocket comes from Tikhonravov and Nikolai Efremov. The first launch reaches 400 meters while later ones go as high as 1500 meters. Friedrich Sanders' GERDAX is launched in November of the same year and reaches a height of 80 meters as the Soviet Union's first liquid-fueled rocket powered by alcohol and liquid oxygen. Sergei Pavlovich Koroyov designs the SK-9, a rocket-powered glider with subvolution in 1929 and is appointed deputy chief of the Jet Propulsion Research Institute in 1933. At this point the institute is working on missiles and rocket-powered aircraft. This is where he meets his lifelong rival Valentin Petrovich Glushko, who has him sent to a Siberian Gulag in 1938. Not cool. Not cool at all. Four years later, during the Second World War, he is working under Glushko's leadership in a specialized Moscow prison for scientists. Years later, after his release, he is in charge of a design team to develop ballistic missiles at the Scientific Research Institute 88. He also becomes chief designer at OKB-1. This role allows him to develop technology that could later be used for space travel. He works on the replication and improvement of the German V-2 and meanwhile he discovers its serious limitations. The Soviet R-2, a modified, longer and slimmer version of the V-2, launches in 1950. 
It has a more powerful engine and two pods along its hull for carrying scientific instruments and animal passengers. Glushko becomes chief designer of OKB-456 in 1946 to be in charge of the development of rocket engines and he once again works with Koroyov on liquid-fueled engines. After successful tests of the first Soviet nuclear weapons in 1949, Koroyov and his team designed the R-7, or Semyorka, for deploying these weapons. This rocket used a cluster of boosters with RD-107 engines around its central core with an RD-108 engine, firing at the same time. The base thus comprised of 20 large nozzles for propulsion, with smaller nozzles to steer the rocket. The idea came from Tikhon Ravov, and eventually this becomes the rocket to make spaceflight a reality. The Soviet Union enters the space race in 1956 with Object D, when Koroyov finally convinces Nikita Khrushchev about the significance of Tikhon Ravov's satellite laboratory project, saying that once the R-7 is complete, the Soviet Union could launch a satellite way bigger than anything the Americans could come up with. I hope you enjoyed this brief introduction to Soviet rocket history and that you join me next time when I continue with Sputnik, Laika, Vostok, among others. Subscribe and Ad Astra!